somebody yeah. brought the bottle of Jack. Dry <laughs> <laughs> state. <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty interesting. They've been doing that for seven generations or something. So that's you know? dry wood. They that's haven't run out of sugar wood. maples yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was an inspiration for a lot of us who were trying to find ways to make biochar from burn piles. In fact, uh, there's a uh, Forest Service soil scientist on the, used to be on the Umqua named Jim Archuleta, who's put out a little paper for the Forest Service to look at called you know, the Jack Daniels method. And he came up with these different configurations he wanted to try. And they've actually built some, some of the ricks, they're calling them ricks, um, on different projects on the Umqua National Forest. But I don't, I haven't heard how they came out. But um, so this is a, these next series of pictures are from a uh, project we did in fall of 2013 outside of Grants Pass, um, uh, about 450 acres of land that was uh, uh, Oak Meadow restoration project. So the the, the project was to Lomakotsi did the work. Um, removing all these young, small diameter firs and pines and making the standard bird piles. So we took a couple of days to go through and try different, this was the first time we'd done this. But we were, we, we, this was our chance to really try different um, stacking methods and pile construction methods to see how it worked. And it just worked amazingly well. Um, so is that dry or? Well, you know, this was in uh, this was in October, and the moisture level of the wood was between 15 and 30 percent. It had already rained a little bit, but it was it was really just perfect. So here we took just some standard piles that had already been built, and we lit one from below. And what happens when you put the flame under cold, damp wood is it heats the wood and the gases rise, but the flames underneath, so the gases don't burn. They make smoke. That's what smoke is. It's condensed volatiles, condensed into particles. Um, and so it's just as simple as when you light it on the top, same type of pile, um, the, the heat is transferring into the material by radiation. You don't need convection to burn these piles. Radiation and conduction are enough. And as that gas rises, it burns in the hot flame and you have very little smoke. So to answer your question about moisture level, that's key, really. You know, if you have 50% moisture, forget it. You're gonna have smoke no matter what you do. Um, but really, you know, some of this wood was really damp, but it, it managed to dry in the, enough in the process that we, it worked fairly well. So this is our, our procedure was as these things burn down, then um, in order to save the charcoal, because you know we saw the process of the gas burns first, and then only after the gas is all gone will the charcoal start to burn. Um, but it's not that hard to interrupt that combustion process and save the charcoal by adding water. So what we learned was, um, you know, we're out in the woods, we didn't have a, we didn't always have the hose could reach everywhere we were going, so we could we had some bladder bags though, and one pile could be quenched with two bladder bags of water, and combined with spreading it out. So when you spread out the, the char, they cool and lose heat. So um, how big was the bladder bag of water? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, a standard so, bladder bag. I don't know how many gallons. I are think in. they're like three or four. Three, three to four oh, okay. gallons. Yeah. Did did all that wood? break down the char or is there still like some unburned there's, parts there's of wood often, yeah, in the there's, middle of the larger Well, stuff. the very bottom, yeah. you know, especially if you have large pieces on the bottom, yeah. some of it won't burn, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, it, you just leave it there. It's it's all good food for microbes. And, yeah. you know. So with this process you did there, you didn't stack the wood a certain way? You just well, hang on, I'm going to oh, show you okay. some I mean, this process. So one of these standard burn piles, um, gave us about 40 gallons of, of biochar. Wow. We measured it in a five gallon bucket. So here's one after we did this for four days and by the final day we're like, okay, we think we know something now how to make the ultimate pile. So we tried to do this like a Rick, like that Jack Daniels Rick. Oh, yeah. and, and 
the, these next slides show the kind of rules we came up with for constructing piles. And this is what we're going to do today. Um, so rule number one, the material size should be as uniform as possible. But for stability, you know, you're going to want to have smaller stuff on the, on the top and bigger on the bottom so it can hold itself up. And of course, you want lots, lots of kindling and, and dry kindling and small diameter stuff on the very top where you're going to start it so you can get it going. The second rule, of course, is lighting on, on the top, not in the bottom. You know, um, actually, you know, going back to the, the standard pile construction method out there is you build a tinderbox inside, like in the middle of the pile. You know, you build a base and then you put kind of a box or a space in the middle where you put small stuff. And that's the standard way of doing it. So we put our tinderbox on top. <clears throat> and then the other, another point here is that, you know, the standard way is to use a drip torch. So you get accelerant dripped all through the pile. So of course you're going to get flame underneath cold, wet wood. So of course you're going to get smoke. So we don't use a drip torch. Um, if you're going to use accelerant, you should try and just mist it over the top. What sort of accelerant would that be? Whiskey. <laughs> oh, yeah. <yes. laughs> you win the prize. <laughs> or gas or kerosene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or in my case, I brought my propane torch, which is my favorite method. <laughs> so rule number three is, you know, this is the rick construction. The space between the sticks should be roughly equal to the diameter of the sticks. Mm -hmm. So that lets air flow through the pile. That's really, really important. And then rule number four, as the pile burns down, you know, it's going to fall apart and sticks are going to fall out of it. And, you know, if you, if you have the ability to tend it and kind of push the unburned stuff into the middle, keep that heat zone, you know, tight and close, um, it'll, it'll work much better. And this is, picture is a really great illustration of um, what produces smoke. Here's this one stick sticking up here in the middle, way away from the heat. So it's cooling down and it's making smoke because it's still enough, you know, there's still vapors being released, but there's no flame. So it's making smoke. <coughs> so that's another reason to consolidate the pile is to avoid smoke. So at that last picture, that's the time to put the water over it? Not quite. Not quite? Not quite. You know, it's always a judgment call. You know, because <coughs> the smaller stuff is going to start turning to ash. What you can do is you can kind of like the Jack Daniels people do, you can use the hose to control it. So, you know, if you've got smaller stuff that's already starting to ash, you can just hit it with the hose. And meanwhile, the stuff in the middle is still going hot. So. Um, you can maximize your char production that way too. So the ash is not that beneficial. You can't really well, do much the, with the ash. Well, the deal is the <coughs> ash is is what's left over. And actually, I'll show a picture. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, help me, can you get <coughs> you? We're looking at the flames and looking at the gas burning. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? Can you tell when the like say when there's no longer any gas there that's burning, and that would be the time that you, you can, can especially yeah because the flames go out. Mm -hmm. When flames go out, when the flames go out, that's when it's really time to think about quenching. Because mm -hmm. yeah, there's not enough gas to sustain a flame, that's time to quench. Um, so and just you know to answer your question about ash, ash is just the minerals that are left over. So you know you have the wood and out, out gases, you're left with char. And then if you burn the char, the only thing left at the end is the minerals. So the calcium, the potassium, um, nitrogen will burn, but you know, those kind of minerals are left, and that's the ash. And those are, that's plant food, but it's also very alkaline. So you use caution when you use that in soil. You don't want to put dump tons of wood ash. And of course, I always put wood ash in my compost, so, you know, mixed with other stuff. Um, I, I was just going to say, in the last two days, I was looking up um, potash, mm -hmm. which is, which a lot of farm clearing, um, because they burned off so much wood, for them to have a side income, they actually took the the ash, put it in water, and created potash, That's which right. they were able to sell as a fertilizer source. So they they increased the the money coming off their property with the waste 
from yeah. burning the forest That's off. That's traditionally always how potash was made. Yeah. Get the name. It's and potassium. I just realized that like two days ago. Yeah. I didn't really. It was a, such a money maker. Yeah. So, um, so this is a different kind of pile construction using a different feedstock. This is vineyard pruning, and they're able to make these giant piles using machine machines. <laughs> There's a lot of material, and this is a huge problem, especially in California. Yeah, you know, where they've got all, so many vineyards, and um, this probably this using a bulldozer to make piles using our forest slash would not work very well because we're you know unless you have a lot of uh, openness exactly because you know this stuff is gnarly. These are gnarly branches. So if you have a lot of gnarly kind of hardwood branches, you could do this. But for um, fir and pine, you know, they're logs, and they would just they would just you know lie down together, and they, you wouldn't get the air space that you need. You don't so want to compact the soil either with the machines. Well, that's a whole other issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> what, what we do when we see machine piles, usually there's a lot of dirt in them too, uh -huh. and that it just doesn't work. It won't work. Oh. So anyway, but this works fairly well. And so here he is spraying some accelerant on the top. <laughs> and they've lit it on the top. And they're now teaching these methods to some really big uh, wine companies like Gallo and they start to use these. And it's cutting down on the smoke a lot. I mean, you still get smoke, you know, especially in something like this where it's not carefully constructed, right. you know. The fire drops down below the unburned material and you do get some smoke, but it's way cleaner than the other ways. So a question about the big companies. Uh -huh. Are they tilling in the uh, charcoal into the soil? What are they doing with the results? I don't know yet. I don't know. This is very new. You know, these pictures are just from like six, a few months ago. So um, I'm sure they're interested in using it. I don't know exactly how they're using it. There have been a lot of studies of using biochar in, in vineyards, and it's clearly beneficial. But well, for example, I'd be using my pruning uh, for my fruit trees right now. Uh -huh. So would I put my charcoal results into my compost pile or into we'll the talk soil about that directly? This afternoon. Okay, thank you. Okay. So here it is. Obviously, it's time to quench. There's no flame. There's a covering of white ash. Um, I don't know if I would wait that long. I probably would have crunched it before this. And here's, they're tr sort of trying to consolidate the pile here. Mm -hmm. And now they've quenched it. There's a l it, it holds a lot of heat. It can take a mm -hmm. piece of work to quench it and put it out. Huge <coughs> pile like that. Yeah. So wow. there's the result. And uh, the other thing about this kind of charcoal is it's really good quality charcoal. I talked earlier about all the different kinds of charcoal. It's, it's good quality charcoal. So that's what we're going to do. We're also going to drag out my, my kilns, cone kilns. I have two versions. One's a cone, one's an inverted pyramid. It's basically the same thing. Um, and this comes from a Japanese technology. Um, for a long time, I knew about these kilns, other people in the biochar world knew about them, but we had no clue how they worked. <laughs> so based on a picture, I built one. I had a welder make me one, but it took me two years to figure out how to use it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is how it works. It's obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that was all the information I had. And finally I figured out, I think finally, finally somebody wrote in Japan wrote a paper in English that, and again, it's not easy to tell what they're trying to say even when they're writing in English because <laughs> the translation is just... You needed a Japanese interpreter to translate. I, yeah, yeah, I didn't know anybody. Anyway, um, that's how it works. Um, this is showing the kiln when it's almost done. And the key thing here is these arrows because this is the key to how it's clean, also a very clean technology in terms of smoke production. You get this um, nice air vortex in here that keeps the flame tight over the, the biomass and makes for efficient heat transfer. 
So, if Barry, this is one of the slides I wanted to show you about the stages of combustion. And so how the cone kiln works is basically by interrupting. So right here, we're gonna interrupt this. So, but this is of course how it works in the, in the pile too. You start with your biomass and it goes through the drying stage and then it goes through um, the volatiles burning and that's also what we call pyrolysis. That's the pyrolysis stage from the video. Then you've got the char and then the char can burn. And when, then you're left with ash after the char burns. But we're just going to cut this off right here. Um, because, and how would we do that? You know, there's different ways to save the char to stop the combustion process. Here's your traditional fire triangle. So you need to remove one of these three things in order to stop the process. And um, so, in our case, it's the oxygen. And here's a, just another nice little diagram, how wood burns. This is how it would burn in your wood stove. This is how you make, actually a lot of people make charcoal in their wood stoves if you have a really good airtight stove. You know if you shut it down, you know, you're gonna look with charcoal because at a certain point, you know, when the, you've got the, the logs, they, they're kind of not completely burned, but you shut it down, you're gonna end up with charcoal. And I know one guy who's been making like a gallon of charcoal every day, mm -hmm. and that adds up. So that's an easy way to make it if you have the right kind of stove. So the way we cut off the oxygen with the cone kiln is we start it, we get a little bit of coals going, and the way it works is we just add the layers gradually. So whereas with the pile, we build it all at once and light it on top, with the cone kiln, we kind of build it as we go. It's the same idea of a rick, but we build it as we go, and each new layer cuts off air to the layers below. So whenever you know it starts looking charred, and you start getting a little ash appearing on the sticks, that's the time to add a new layer. And you can see how clean that burns because the flame is on top. Any smoke that comes out of there is getting burned. And by the time you fill this whole kiln, you know, the whole thing is full of charcoal. And I just hit it with the, water, the hose and quench it and unload my char. So let's go make some biochar. <laughs> Uh, just a note, if you have a coffee cup, leave it in your chair to come back.